like, I mean, he always try to, he tries to say the activating event is his father falling off the, the roof. When you look at that, is that what you think when you think of Artie is like, okay, okay that's, if that's what he thinks, then I'm always curious because it seems like he likes to use that sort of as a crutch. It's a terrible, obviously, moment in his life. But is that, do you think as a doctor that, okay, that opens up addiction? Or is it just, that's a sickness? Because that's what I saw with Matthew Perry. The guy was sick. He couldn't, he couldn't stop drinking. Right. So I think everything matters, right? So your DNA matters. Your physiology matters. There's some people like me, I'm lucky, right? Like I drink alcohol, I go to sleep. I get no euphoria. I'm physiologically immune to becoming alcoholic. Artie's not, obviously. Um, However, would I take it as gospel when he says, look, this trouble in my life took off when my father fell off the roof? Well, there's got to be more to the story, you'd say, if you're an investigative journalist, uh, which I used to be, or a psychiatrist, which I spent so many years doing, because for some people, they'd say, wow, well, I did see my dad continue to live his life. I mean, even with this profound injury, you know, he continued to be a dad um, or you can't break me might be another lesson. So the fact that he identifies that, great, that's really important. What do you think about all of that? But then there's more because you'd want to dig deep, more deeply and figure out, well, what do you think about that event? And how was he before that event toward you as a person? And how was he afterwards? How was your mother's relationship with him before it, after it? What were your hopes for him? You're a broken guy, Artie. What are your hopes for yourself? Right. So in other words, uh, to try to figure out, is this laced into his DNA, this tendency toward substances, or is it also that you'd want to say, well, look, what does it mean to you if you weren't impaired? Does that mean you've broken ranks with your dad, Um, that you've gotten up out of the wheelchair and that doesn't feel right because he never did? So I start really uh, processing things with people and why. To find the narrative that feels like the truth, because people have a remarkable capacity when they are possessed of that, when they say, yes, that's my story, they do pretty well. They don't run from it necessarily. They're like, okay, fair enough. Um, Now I can build better because I can see what really happened in my life. Too many people live their lives. I, I use an analogy, like if you tried to read a book And the pages in the middle were glued together, say the middle 150 pages. And someone said, that's okay, just read the first 50 and the last 100, and you write the ending. You'd say, I I don't know, I I, want to get into those glued together pages, but most people don't. And they really need to, because otherwise, what do you feel? A sense of desperation, sort of depersonalization. I don't know this person. Yeah, that's you. That's a problem because it leads to anxiety. It might make you want to drink. For instance, I'm not saying anything about Artie, but if you were a person who was wishing because you didn't like your dad, okay, or there was friction and you were half wishing, I wish the guy would fall off the roof for God's sake, and then he does, that's a different problem, right, than if you had this incredibly loving relationship and your dad was injured so severely, it's still quite different because you might beat yourself up for the rest of your life unless someone intervenes to help you out. If you had this unconscious wish and you think, you know, I probably caused it with my wish, but you might not even remember that. That's so <laughs> that's my spiel. That's deep. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you follow him. Like- that's pretty deep. That is deep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you follow him now or see what he's up to, but he comes on social media, then he goes away. He'll start up a podcast. Uh, just professional opinion. Where do you think he is? Like, how do you think he's doing? Everyone you talk to, like I said, I talked to his author. I talked to his buddy that was with part of uh, Beer League. They all say, hey, he's, you know, he just, he's just trying to work on himself and stay out of this thing, you know, so. That's all you can do. I mean, I don't know how he's doing, but, um, you know, I always think, like, Broken people are pretty good stocks to buy, um, right? Because the comeback, we all understand the comeback. Everyone loves a comeback. So if he were my client now or I was sitting with him over coffee, I'd say, look, 
Uh, the only question is, what's it going to look like, right? So, what is your come? You get it's going to be bigger than what you were doing before. What's it going to be? And make sure you love it, right? Because you know there are people of that book opened by Andre Agassi, like he didn't even want to be a tennis player. He it was an accident that he was good at it, and his parents pushed him to do it. Um, and so he had sort of an Achilles heel, which is, oh, I'm really good at that. And they want me to do it. So he ended up doing it. But what, you, you got to get to the core of who you really are and why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so you came in for a Howard and Beth session very early on. They weren't even married yet. Uh, I watched all of these, by the way, just to kind of research and, and, and oh, cool. to look back. They're all on YouTube, so you can check them out. Uh, Beth looks like a prisoner then, and I don't know if you're listening to the show, but just this week she sounds like a prisoner now because Howard is afraid of COVID. Beth wants to go out, and it's sort of the same dynamic they had before they were married, according to this. Uh, When I came away from watching this, because, again, I hadn't heard it in 10 years, whatever it was, but Beth was just like, yes, Howard, whatever you want to do, Howard. I love you, Howard. I'm into whatever you want to do. That's what I got out of it. Um, How was it for you to kind of be in there? Because, you know, that could have been ugly turned out okay uh and they're still together so that's i'm quite interested by all that but uh just that that whole kind of dynamic with them yeah they're still together which is you know good data that there was a good reason to get married and to be together to begin with um you know when when i talked to howard one of the things we talked about was this carpet i remember that (laughs) in one of their rooms and like he wouldn't she had picked it out the only thing she had picked out in the whole apartment Right. And he just wouldn't not wear shoes walking on the white carpet. It's the one thing. Right. But those things have meaning. And so when you say prisoner, it's like, well, what's a prisoner? Prisoner is somebody who doesn't really have any rights or authority. Um, And yeah, that's when he got choked up when I said, listen, I think she might actually love you a lot. And at some point, you're going to have to take the opportunity to kind of share a little authority to some extent and invite her to be present right the white carpet you're trying to kill her you're basically like you know what you picked out the white carpet that's exactly where i'm gonna leave dirt marks because you don't exist in some ways in this place so hopefully there's more space for her now except the covid thing is like listen dude if you've got anxiety and ocd it's on you you got to treat it. You can't expect that other people are going to like share your OCD and cater to it. Cause that's not even a favor to you. Right. So there you go. Are you, are you listening at all these days? Because this was just fresh out of this, this week's. And I, I kind of put updates in here for people to just hear the show. Uh, I'm not real entertained by it as much, but uh, people seem to like to hear what's going on. Have you heard any of this stuff? I, I'm just curious if you've had any, any contact with Howard in the last 10, 15. I, I'll be very, so listen, you know, I have a, a, a particular point of disagreement with Howard that led to my being on less frequently, which was Chaz Bono, um, right? So um, it, I think it was, I don't know if he called me or if it was, I think it was a radio interview, but it wasn't uh, videotaped. Um, but basically it was when I said, listen, it's probably not the best idea to watch Chaz Bono on Dancing with the Stars for kids because they might decide that's me. I, I want to change my gender. And he said, you know, Dr. Abelo, do you really believe that watching that could lead to someone making that decision? And I said, yeah, kind of. Right. And so because adulation heaped upon somebody who to me. It's more of a psychological problem than a choice. Hey, not everyone agrees with me. I know that. And he didn't vehemently. And that kind of fractured my appearances on the show. But I'd be happy to go back and discuss it with him now that, you know, it's become something of a phenomenon in the world and maybe not all to the good. Yeah, well, I think once your opinion is not the same as his, you're not welcome, correct? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I could help him to see where he's wrong. Uh, so that that could be fun. Are you listening at all? Have you heard any of the last couple of years? I've, intermittently, I tune in. And I think he's I mean, he's so supremely talented that, you know, I enjoy it still. Um, and uh, and I'm sure, you know, tons of people still do. And so, yeah, I mean, he had to perhaps, you know, his extraordinary heyday and 
as you said, maybe the energy is a little less. But nonetheless, I mean, he's a genius. So speaking of geniuses, Riley Martin was another one of your clients. <laughs> quote. Um, Riley Martin, I know. What? And it's so sad he's, he's no longer with us. And uh, But um, those are some interesting uh, moments with you and him. Um, as you sort of broke... Who no one really knew what was going on with this guy, and you almost kind of broke through to him. You almost got him out. Like, tell me a little bit about working with him and what you got. It seemed like you were the one person that almost got kind of who, who this guy was. He, he just wasn't some kook looking at aliens or thinking about aliens. You you kind of brought it out of him. Yeah, no, he'd been through trouble in his childhood. He'd been through real trouble. He'd been lots of brawls. Um, he'd had big losses as you know, so many of us do, as everybody does eventually, but he he became much more human, as you say, no, 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 okay, look, I get it, the aliens, I understand, but, you know, tell me uh, the next biggest event in your life, and then you get underneath the aliens, which, by the way, can be the same as drinking. I'm not saying aliens don't exist, but if you're obsessed with aliens, then you invite me to start digging and say, all right, great, great. Can we talk now about anything other than the aliens? Because I think you've got a life underneath the flying saucers. I did buy three tickets from him. I still have them. Um, I bought three tickets. You know, he made these tickets with drawings on them. <laughs> and um, he's like, it's, it's like a deal that nobody could say no to because he's like, look, if you have one of these, you get to go on the spaceship when Earth is completely destroyed, right? And... I can sell you four right now, one for you, your wife, and your two kids. I'm like, how much? He's like, $20. I'm like, $20 to escape the destruction of the earth? I'm like, I'm in. I said, see, your price point is perfect. Because if you said it's a 1000 each, I, 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 I'm not going to do it. But like 20 bucks. I might, I'm, I buy lottery tickets, for God's sake. I have more chance of being hit by lightning. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think he was a great, a great interview, great piece of uh, humanity there. Yeah. And, and sorely missed, no doubt, by many people. Okay. And then the last uh, summit you had with Sal and, and his, his wife, um, and that was, that just seemed like a real, um, like, you're in a <laughs> marriage counseling office with these two, because after a while, you don't feel like you're on the radio anymore. Sal's losing, and he's crying you finally get Christine to sort of stop. She had a shell up, you know, jokes and all. They both were joking each other. But in the end, it, it, I think they're still together seemingly. And they seemingly have this loving thing. But it was just, again, I watched all of these kind of leading up to this one. Um, your thoughts on that one? Because that one really had some interesting uh, dynamics to it. Um, the way that, that I think you pulled a lot out of them in an hour on the, on the radio. Like to be on the radio, it was crazy. It's, yeah, to be on the radio is interesting, but the, the thing about being on the radio or when I did my talk show is that if you've got compressed time and a microphone, it actually helps you uh, with psychiatry or psychology or whatever we were doing there um, because uh, people feel like it's, it's tougher to not tell the truth when it's being recorded for, for anything but a sociopath. Right. It's much tougher. And so the microphone is your friend if you're the psychiatrist. And secondly, marriages are not random. So if you proceed from that philosophy, like, no, 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 you found this person for one of two reasons. Unless you're a giant, like psychologically, people I have found choose a marriage partner either because they replicate what they grew up with, which may be bad, right? Because they may be drawn to the same mischief or chaos that they grew up with, that was home, right? Or out of desperation, they run to the other side of the seesaw. And so if you had a controlling mother or father, you pick somebody who's disabled in some way, right? Because now, okay, I, now that person cannot exert control over me. Or these women who date guys in prison, it's like, well, why is that? Uh, tell me about your dad, right? Because this one's in a cage. You, he can't hurt you. Um, what you want to be is at the middle, the fulcrum of the seesaw, but that can take three, mar three marriages before you realize that. Or as a guy told me, I used to work for a jeweler 
and he was getting married for the fifth time. I was in high school. I said, Jack, what can you tell me about marriage? He said, I can tell you this. The first four, you swear it's them. <laughs> I just heard a friend of mine talked about um, an anniversary, and uh, the DJ said, hey, you guys have been married 50 years. What, what, you know, what do you want to say? The husband takes the microphone and says, yeah, the first 50 years are the worst. <laughs> I heard that line. I use that one. I think that's good. <laughs> exactly. There's a book called Marriage, Dead or Alive that's a classic that says, listen, everybody's got it all wrong. When you approach this, it's like you should be approaching it not with a big celebration thinking this is going to be the best experience of my life. You approach it as though it's a high wire act. Like, and you should be thinking like a Zen monk saying, you know, okay, I'm entering monkdom or whatever, monkhood. And this is not going to be easy. But 60 years from now, I'll look back and I'll say, what richness, what poetry. But along the way, you got to expect all kinds of trouble. Yeah, that's it's what impossible I want to. Right. And I always just sort of look towards those days. Like we have a 15 year old upstairs doing some math and the work and the stuff. And I just sort of think about retirement and how we're going to travel. And like I see my Aunt Debbie's out there. She's 73. They're taking cruises. I'm, like we had this weird thought, like, do they even, do you think they still have sex? Like, that's so weird. Like they're in the seven, you know, so we have these weird discussions. Right. Hopefully Aunt Debbie's not watching. Um, the, the one Hopefully that Debbie's not watching, but it's, it's a good question. But, you know, and I have the benefit of tons of people who've come to me who tell me, you know, things. So I have a very wide net that I cast. And the truth is, if you're not repelled by your spouse after seven, five, ten years, you're a hero, right? Because most people at that point are like, uh, I got to, I, I got to continue this. And that's the truth. It's pain, but you know, that's why I help people a lot. People who um, have thought, you know what, maybe I'm out of this. I'm done um, because this happened. And I think I could have more fun with this other person. I'm like, okay, how about if your spouse, instead of all the fun, Let's think if your spouse goes in and gets a bad result on a blood test and has to go, God forbid, I'm not going to wood for chemotherapy. You're okay with some guy named Fred taking her, right? <gasps> Guys get blown back in their seat. They're like, I'm like, see, you're screwed because you're still in love. It's just we needed to reveal it because it's not, again, it's not the fun times. It's are you going to show up when there's trouble? And if you're if you if you don't want someone else to be there, then you better sit tight. 